do I sell? Do I not sell? I don't know what, how do I, what do I? And the majority of my clients are women and or really spiritual. Um, and again, I've never marketed that. It just, it just, it just happens, right? But I do think that one of the most important things that can happen for us now is for us to really um, turn inward. And what I mean by that as business owners is really trusting our own instincts. And uh, especially as women, I think we can let our instincts be the softest voice in the room and they should be the loudest. And I think this is a real opportunity for us to practice that as a skill, not as some like esoteric talent some people have, but as a skill. And if we can learn it now in the midst of this, then we can really make it as strong and as connected and as internal as we need it to be so that when we open back up, we have access to it. Hello, welcome to Soul Seekers TV. I am one of your soul guides, Linda Kraus Barnett. And I am one of your other soul guides. Uh, well, I guess the other soul guide, <laughs> Cheryl Barrow Wolfson. <laughs> and on today's episode, we are going to be talking about how to trust yourself to do business in a crisis. And we have a very, very special guest, a dear friend of mine and an amazing business coach, Sarah Walt. <laughs> This looks good. It looks good. I like it. Hi, everybody. I am so happy to be here with you guys today. This is such an important topic, and oh, I can't wait to get started. Exactly. I think lots of people are really anxious to get this information and, and kind of let the density and the stress of a topic like this feel like flow and ease. So thank you for being here. Oh, I love how you worded that. Thank you for having me. Oh, that's perfect. That's the perfect description. Yeah, you know, I know a lot of um, our viewers and our friends, you know, are coaches and healers and entrepreneurs and even those people who are not but are finding themselves in this situation of being at home and having to figure out how to make life work right now um, during a crisis. And so thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. I know this is something you're super, super passionate about. Um, so before we just like, well, go dive deep. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself first and then like, let's start talking. We'll just start chatting. Sure. Well, I've been a business mentor for 12 years now. I can't believe that by myself on my own out there in the world doing this. Um, and I absolutely love it, but it comes from a 15 year background in technology. And I was a product manager inside these huge tech companies. And I was always the only woman. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> These are just skills that anybody can learn. Why am I the only woman in the room all the time? Sometimes the head of HR would be with me. But outside of that, I was always the only woman in the room. And I really started to study personal development and a little bit more about entrepreneurship. And I felt so lucky because I was kind of running small businesses inside of this huge, these hugely backed businesses, right? So I got this entrepreneurial bug. I started helping people get venture capital. And I realized that there's actually to the point of the name of your show, there was a spiritual element that's been missing in business a lot. And people don't look at me and go, oh my gosh, she's super spiritual. And yet they come and find me and they're like, oh my God, she is super spiritual. And I attract healers and I attract astrologers and um, people who really help people with eating and wellness um, and therapy. And I love it. It's not intentional and I'll never market it explicitly at all, but it's what I tend to really thrive inside of. And I think a moment like this, <laughs> is when the rubber has hit the road and we are finding out what we're made of both inside of business as a society we're understanding what our social contracts are with each other and i think honestly what our spiritual contracts are with each other so that's who i am that's what i'm here to do and i cannot wait to talk about this today oh i am so excited for this conversation because um it is so timely and so important right now yeah it is. It so is. how do we do this? How, how do we do business right now, oh, stuck in our homes with our families? I mean, I won't even talk about the life balance part of it, although that too, but just the business itself. Yeah. Well, I think- And the transition yeah, too. I'm sorry. I was going to say the transition, you know, like- the, even if people are not, not only are people learning how to do business from home, but now they're having to do that alongside of a house full of people. Um, so there's no privacy. There's, there's just so many variables. So everybody's getting hit with newness in overwhelm all at once. So it's a big deal. And by the way, can we talk about like the serious amount of trauma that we've gone through as humanity at the same time, right? So 
we're trying to do all this on top of the fact that a lot of people aren't even acknowledging that it's traumatic to have your day-to-day -day life get upended. I, you know, I've been joking around this whole time. I feel incredibly lucky. I'm like, my life didn't really change. It looks the same. <laughs> lucky for me, right? But it's yeah. like, I watch my kids go through stuff and they're here with me. And what's changed is you'll hear them from time to time because they're here with me. But outside of that, I feel really lucky that things didn't change. However, all that being said, when people have gone from having to commute their way outside or they had a team of people that were around them all the time, um, they're having to learn these new technologies on top of a serious trauma. And also the understanding, and this is where our shared humanity and our shared spirituality comes in, also the understanding that every single one of us have, that our physical bodies are going to have to deal with this one way or the other. None of us are getting away from this. We're either going to have to know somebody who gets sick, right? right. Or we're going to have to huh? deal with covering ourselves. Yep. Yeah, people we love go in the hospital. We've lost people that we love. Um, to people who don't believe it's happening, but we all know sooner or later, whether it's through a vaccine, through someone that we know, through someone that we love, we're going to have to deal with this. And that sort of leaves this other open end. So the first thing I want to say to everybody is please breathe. It's like this constant, like, go, 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 go. And I saw the funniest meme. It was about Gwyneth Paltrow, who was like, read a book or no, write a book. <laughs> learn a new language. And the meme was like, I just wiped crumbs out of my bra. I'm pretty sure that's not <laughs> happening. Right. And I was like, yes, you know, and meanwhile, like I'm motivating people too. And I'm like, listen, get up, do it. But I think the key to all of this, right. So dealing with the trauma, dealing with the new technology, uh -huh. dealing with the different surroundings is recognizing our, our shared humanity through this, but also that your instincts will never steer you wrong. And I think that this great pause is going to give us the opportunity we've needed and ached for to learn how to let our own instincts be the loudest voice in the room. Because a lot of the time, specifically for women, though men suffer from it too, our instincts are the softest, the softest voice in the room, right? And I'll take that all the way when I talk about this in public, when I'm allowed again. I talk about how, like <laughs> women who, um, who suffered rape, I'll be like, I didn't want to be rude. He gave me the creeps, but it's like, oh my God. And that's like the most severe um, example of that. But if you're doing that in your business and you're letting somebody take advantage of that, or you're pulling back because you're worried about what other people are going to think, but your instincts right. are screaming at you, that's the same thing. Yeah. And it's time for us to recognize that. And I think this is a massive opportunity. Like if you want to pick a skill to learn, it's to learn how to go inside and get reconnected to that because it will never steer you wrong. Ever, 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 ever. Every woman I've ever interviewed who has been violated like that, every single one said, I knew it. And that's actually the pain, the physical part we get over. But when we betray our instincts, when we don't listen, when we do things that feel really uncomfortable because we're worried about what other people are going to think, Oh man, that is a betrayal and a sense of pain that is so much harder to heal. And I think this is an opportunity for us to heal that. And you might be thinking, what the hell does that have to do with business? Sorry, I swore. But <laughs> it's that people Surely are like, do you I haven't settle? watched enough of our shows. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, you know, some people are like, Sarah, what does this have to do with business? And the answer is, if you're wondering whether or not you can sell, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be slimy. People are going to think I'm nasty. People are going to think I'm awful. It's like, don't be nasty or awful. <laughs> like, you, like, what are you talking about? Like, why would that be your concern? Unless you are worried somewhere in there that you are. When you are genuinely caring or you have something that's of service that can help people. And P.S., that includes you being able to pay your mortgage, you being able to take care of your children while they're home at school, you being able to surprise your neighbors with something if they're older and they can't go to the store. That's all service. And you can't do any of that, as we've decided as a society right now, unless you have money. That's part of our social contract as well. We've decided that for now. It might change. I don't know. But for right now, money is the most powerful tool that we have access to. And if you trust yourself, if you have something that is amazing for you to offer the world that can make a difference, go get more money so that you can have a bigger impact on the conversation that's happening right, right now. I love that, Sarah. So that's that's my honest to God. That's where people and like, you know, I was like, like, yeah. 
I feel like we're it's it's it, it, we're in the safety of the people and place that we're the most comfortable. So if we could learn that skill of guide, guidance by intuition now, I think it will so serve us when we have to make the big decisions of emerging out of this. You know, do. do what is this going to look like? And do I want to go back? Do I not? Am I staying virtual? Am I not? Will my kids go back? There's going to be a lot of tough choices to make, um, which will be made more intuitively if we can access that while in this, you know, bubble. Yeah. Pan pandemia, panda. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Pandemic. Yeah. I'm so tired of Pandemonium. <laughs> Pandemonium, for sure. Yeah, but yeah, that's beautiful. I love every single thing you said. Oh, I'm so, so glad. Mm -hmm. How do we how do we begin this process? Like I really want to um step ask step. You, yeah. you know, as much as possible, a step by step, like how do we start to trust ourselves again in business? I, and never mind again. Um, you know, like, how about we just, how do we start to trust ourselves in business, period? Because there's plenty of people, especially in the coaching and healing industries, um, any light worker out there who hold themselves back because it feel, they feel disconnected from the financial aspect of money. But you put it so beautifully, which is like, if you really want to make an impact in this social construct, you have to have the money. So if you want to have a voice and make true change, then you better start figuring out how to bring that money to you so that we can start to play in, you know, with the big boys and start changing things. Absolutely. So yeah. How do we start? yeah. Sorry, Linda. I mean, yeah, the, um, the first step, like if we want to somehow construct this into a paradigm, right, where we can sort of take actions inside of it, which I totally understand that's what everybody wants. So the first thing is you got to rewrite your relationship to money. For some people, that's literally like some people will do exercises. There's thousands of, you know, limiting belief exercises anyone can pick up and try. But the one thing that sort of came to me, and when I talk about this, I, I always laugh, but, um, I have a signature talk about money and it's called money is love. And people always are like, uh, what? <laughs> like, and they just freak out. I'm like, I know. I don't I, know what I, you're talking about. <laughs> like, no, it's not. Like, I, like, I know. Just hang on for a second. Just breathe. But, uh, yeah, but the idea actually came to me. I don't even think it's my idea. I don't know where it came from, but I was actually rehearsing another talk and I was out in the Poconos. It was beautiful. And I heard that. I literally heard it. I don't, I don't know where these things happen. I heard it. It was like money is love. And I was like, no, I don't want that. Don't give me that. I don't want that conversation. <laughs> and it just kept coming. And I was like, all right, let me look at it. And what I started to understand, if you want to rewrite your relationship to money, you need to understand the lens through which you view it. And when I heard that money is love, I had spent my entire 20s supporting Marianne Williamson um, with some of her audio files. And so I was in the studio with her a lot and listening to her um, talk about the Course in Miracles, which I personally have not studied, so I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert. I'm not. But I do understand that inside the, the construct of that conversation is that there's really only two emotions. There's love and there's fear. And love's job is to stoke fear so it can bring it to the surface so it can be healed. And the way it gets healed is it gets transmuted back into love. So when I heard money is love, I was thinking like, oh, I love money. And it's like, no, 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 no. Money carries the same energy as love. I'm sorry, I was mute. I think yeah. you just blew Linda's mind. <laughs> yeah, right, Linda. You didn't, you she really? doesn't think you did. You did. <laughs> <laughs> I always try to look at the camera, so I saw activity, but I wasn't. <laughs> it was my brain going. <laughs> yeah, you just exploded her mind. You just were there. <laughs> Over there. Yeah. So when I got that. And I was like, back the truck up, people. <laughs> it was that that's why people get afraid of money. Because it brings up everything you haven't healed. And that's why people run. That's why people who win the lottery get rid of it as fast as possible. That's why people call it evil. Because it scares them. Because they know in order to hold that much love, they're going to have to deal with what they haven't healed. And it was like, oh my God. And now I have to go into a venture capital meeting and pitch to get $6 million. And I just decided money is love. Oh, that's going to go well. Right. And I was like, what just happened to my brain? <laughs> but I will tell you inside of that construct and me actually understanding that there were things I hadn't dealt with yet. 
that was why the money wasn't coming in at the level I felt was congruent with what I was providing. And so what I'll say to people who are really struggling financially, and it's going to be interesting to see how this goes throughout, throughout our entire economy as this develops for a longer and longer time. I was crying this morning after watching Alicia Keys' video. Thanks, Alicia. But I was crying like that beautiful, I think it's a good job was the name of the video, and it showed all of the invisible people who keep our world running constantly. And it absolutely brought me to my knees with just gratitude and like, oh my God. And there I was, it's my husband's birthday today. I'm trying to make his birthday cake and we don't have the ingredients and I'm not going to run to the store. Right. I mean, it was like this whole thing of like, what is going to happen through this? And what came to me is I really hope that all of us, each and every one of us deal with what there is for us to deal with so that this money, this form of love, this energy that's out there, this massive abundance that by the way, the trees, the flowers, the grass have no problem accessing. Like, what is it going to take for us to heal in order to spread that out in a way that everyone has access to this tool that helps them heal? And that's sort of what came to me as I was thinking about talking to you guys today and as I was talking to my own group and I did a couple of interviews for some other things today. And this has been the constant conversation, which is what do we need to heal in order to allow that amount of love into our lives? I think that's for every single business owner to ask themselves specifically. And I think it's for us on a larger scale. When we look at people out there that we don't agree with, when we look at the divisiveness, when we look at the people saying business is bad or the other people saying, you know, profits over people, basically, right? Like, I don't care if you die, I want a haircut. Like that's where it's like, what do we need to do? And who are we going to be in the face of that as business owners? And how much money is it going to take for us to get out there and start to affect that conversation in a way that matters to each one of us? And I think that's the first step is <laughs> you've got to heal yeah. your relationship to that money. And you know, money is love. Um, I, you've said it and presented it beautifully. And, and if there's any proof that what you're saying resonates a thousand percent is you are literally speaking to moi. Like, <laughs> you know, I mean, aside from the money blocks I came into this pandemic with, my husband and I are currently incomeless. Um, and so there's an abundance of stress around money as many people living this pandemic are in that situation, you know, non-essential workers. My husband's in the movie business. It is shut down. I am on a leave of absence. I am not making an income. So we're just like looking at each other like, well, the bills are not stopping, but the money has stopped. So I love redefining it as love because love is not something I would ever close my door to. You know, if anybody came to me with love, I'm like a love monster. Like I love love. And so if I that ever look at right. So accurate. to think of money as love and then to think that I'm resisting love mm -hmm. changes the game because I would never resist love. Right. But can you be, um, so for someone like me, where conceptually that's really beautiful, but like, with blocks, how does that get put into application? You know, how do you really shift that? Yeah, well that, yeah. Oh my God, Lynn, I'm so glad you asked that because it's so great to have these like conceptual conversations. You're like, great, the electric bill though, coming, right? It's like, you know, uh, nice. Okay, so yeah, so the practical application there is the electric bill comes in and you go, how do, how do, how do, how do, right? And the ego takes over and you start from doing the freak out, which is totally understandable, is you actually put it to the side and you ask yourself or your guides or however it works for you, God, whatever, if you pray, whatever, is the idea is awesome. I'm here to serve. What do you need me to do today? And I don't mean that in a like, oh, what do you need? Not like that, but it's like, who needs me today? And I ask, I tell my clients and my students to ask that question every single day, who needs me today? And the first three people that pop into your head, you call, you text, you reach out to, and you don't do that to get money, but you never know. <laughs> Sorry, we're <Sarah! both. laughs> Yes, dear. I blew it again, didn't I? Is yeah. it okay? Oh, this, like, I, didn't I tell you annoying? we're going to love her? I'm going to short circuit here. Slow down. <laughs> <laughs> so... If you allow your instincts to guide you through that and you follow through, because here's the thing, money loves action, not frenetic, fearful. <laughs> now the money has brought that fear to the surface. So the fear that you feel that is by design in my, in my opinion, 
it has brought up exactly what you need to heal. So what you start saying to yourself, you piece of crap, who the hell do you think you are? Oh, you have all these hobbies, but you're not me. Whatever starts to come in. And by the way, the reason I know what some of those are is because they're not even original. <laughs> they're just human. You're welcome. <laughs> Everybody has the same ones, by the way, especially entrepreneurs. Like, who the hell do you think you are? Right, right. You're going to go out. Who do you think you are? Steve Jobs. Like, all that will start to come in. It's just like, hi, welcome to humanity. You plugged into the common consciousness. Congratulations. Now, let's look at what there is for you to heal there. So you want to feel the fear, not run from it. Like I said, you don't want to live in it and like, yes and no. Like, put it to the side and go, all right, you're telling me to heal something. Who needs me? Because we all know inside of service is where healing takes place. So if you start asking who needs me today, you will be shocked at what comes back. Somebody might say, oh my God, I ran into somebody the other day who needs you to do blah, 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 blah. Or, oh my God, I was thinking about you. Could you help me with? And then when it comes to the practical application of saying, yes, happy to, I'll send, does this price work for you? Or I'll send you an invoice in a little bit. Does that work for you? Those sorts of just straight conversations where there's no emotion, it's like the sky's blue, the trees are green, uh, that's 150 and that works by invoice, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So it's just this conversation that happens on top of, I'm going to lead with service here and I'm here to serve you because I'm healing something and I bet I have something I can help you heal. And that can literally be anything from, I don't know how to plant a vegetable garden to, can you knit me an Afghan to, Hey, can you work on some spiritual healing? Or, Hey, do you know how to put these salves together to help my feet, which are by the way, falling apart because I can't get a pedicure. Like all of that is valuable. And when we talk about money as love, it's an exchange of love. So you give the service and they give you love back. And that's all that that transaction is. So what I'll ask you, Linda, as you start to deal with this fear and face it, is look at the amount of service and love that you're giving out in the world and figure out how much love should be in your bank account to match that. Oh. And that needs to be congruent. What? <laughs> And on that note, and I don't know. I can't tell. I don't know her that well. She okay? <laughs> yeah, she's Sarah, okay. will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm an equal opportunity wife. Okay, cool. <laughs> what I yeah. will add to that too is, and this is not just for my best friend, but for all of my friends watching right now, is when you are hesitating to share your gifts you are holding back the love you have to offer to others. A hundred percent, Trish. And it's like, so then why would you hold back? Just because one person doesn't want to hug you doesn't mean that you don't hug all the other 12 people that are waiting for your hug. Or that you're not huggable at all. Exactly. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I love that because how many people especially the people who are, you know, a lot of people who are having to go virtual and having to show up online and be more visible. It's scary as shit because now you're like, well, great, I'm going to do it. That's fine. But now look at, I've just opened myself to judgment on so many levels and I don't know if I can handle it. You know, am I strong enough to get back feedback that doesn't validate that I'm enough? Sure you are. But yes. I think that's, it's Absolutely. so, it's so. I mean, listen. I don't mean that to be flippant, Linda. I don't mean to say that like flippantly, but um, that idea that we are so uh, like um, fragile doesn't serve. Oh, and yeah. quite frankly, kind of goes, I had other people in my group this morning talking about, I feel so guilty that I'm able to make money. I'm like, no, that's self-serving. That just makes you feel better because I feel guilty. No, oh, I you love can feel that. bad. You can connect. Like I said, I was sobbing over Alicia Keys video. Like, like, so, like the first time I've wept since the pandemic started, like just on the kitchen floor sobbing, right? Without the right ingredients for my husband's birthday cake. Like what just happened, right? That we can connect, but I didn't call off all my appointments all day because I feel good. I feel bad. No, no, no. That's hiding and it's self-serving and it's keeping you small. And it's the same thing about comments online. Listen, people are bored. What do you care? Like, and and Trish and I talk about critique, this all the time. People critique freaking Oprah. Like, oh my God, get a life. <laughs> you do a quarter of that, what that woman does, you can get out of your underwear and maybe critique her, but come on. <laughs> like, seriously, they like, get a life. 
So there is a little bit of that, but Linda, you're speaking to something that's actually really important. And that is a lot of people will hold back from being successful because speaking of money, there is a tax that we all must pay as we become more successful. And that tax is critique. And we know that like deep down, we know, well, if I just stay under the radar enough, it'll be fine. Cause you know, you hit a level, there'll be some jackass in the middle of Minnesota. Who's like, you're ugly. And you're like, oh man, right. It's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. That quote that you just made, first of all, needs to like go viral. <laughs> but that's just a tidbit of side note, but that, that, that needs to be like marketed on billboards because yeah. I love that in yeah. so many ways. That's yeah, but it's true, we right? We've all, it. I've done it too. I'm like, oh, maybe this one we don't, I don't want to talk about money as love, right? Like we all can have that experience of like, Shh, I'm going to get critiqued. I go out with this and that's okay. And I think once we expect it too, it doesn't come back quite so hard delete it. And if it's a constructive, thoughtful comment about maybe something you could do better, that's awesome. That's data. Corporations pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to get that kind of feedback. Go, oh, thank you for doing that for free, baby. Love you. Like it, there's so many different ways to perceive that. And so when I hear somebody say they're so fragile, I'm like, you're not that fragile. That's a way to abdicate responsibility for the gifts you've been given. And that just doesn't fly by me. So let's get it together, get it out there, do what it, there is for you to do and not hide behind. I work mostly with women, this little girl persona of, but it will hurt my feelings. It might, and you'll be okay. Yeah, or that persona of, you know, that same voice saying, but I might hurt somebody else's feelings. Yeah. And which I okay. think, you know, which I think is a powerful thing that Linda and I talk about all the time when we're in the midst of a conversation and we see it, we see people out there doing good and we see the myriad of comments of people tearing them down trying to tell them how the good they're doing isn't good enough mm -hmm. or the way they're doing the good could be better if they would do it a different way and then you're like you can't win like i've literally been re like re personally researching this for myself as i've tried to get used to um, you know, kind of like switching my mindset to be prepared for the critique because I'm prepared for us to take this to the next level. And I'm like, I'll take it. And I mean, and I'm someone who's, I've been on a national TV show. I've, I've had like people cutting me down when I was 18 and I was on a sports show. I was on a Portuguese language. I was the Portuguese language sports anchor. Um, in Toronto, I was 18 and I literally experienced the whole anchor man thing where it was like the guy who was doing the teleprompter for me would go faster to try to trip me up um, because I was a woman, because I was 18, and because I was cute and everyone assuming I didn't know what I was doing. And so I, I lived through that and I lived through it. Like it wasn't like, it was horrible and I never would, no, I loved it. I was like, bring it on. But it's like, at this stage of my life, knowing what's coming, I'm like, can I handle it now? You know, am I prepared? I have a family, I have children. Are they gonna personally attack me? Are they gonna start attacking my family? How is this gonna affect, you know, that part? So I thank you for making this a part of this conversation mm -hmm. because I, it's really important that we, you know, like you can only walk your path and allow everyone else to walk there. Yes. And I think your point, the reason I said, if, uh, if you hurt other people's feelings, mm -hmm. right? Like you were saying, you've done the research, you guys have watched how other people get ripped apart or do it this way or do it that way. Yeah. That's those people telling you one, what they see wrong with themselves. You have to understand that, right? You can't see in someone else what you're not worried about. Nothing you know what I'm saying? Like people are like, aren't you worried he's going to cheat? And I'm like, no. Like that, and it's like, and not like, not like because he's not capable of it, everybody is, but I, it doesn't, I, no, it's not even in my wheelhouse. Could it happen? Sure. But I'm not going to focus on that right now because I'm not going to do it. So I'm busy doing other stuff and developing the relationship. Right. And that's just an example. But it's like, if other people are going to tear you down and say, you're not doing enough, the response is, where could you do more? Are you feeling okay? Because what they're saying is, I'm not doing enough. <laughs> it's like every single time you see one of those, basically what they're telling you is what their pain point is. And they're sharing with you what they're afraid of. 
And so it's about having compassion and empathy and inclusion in that and like to not take that personally. And I have to have that conversation with every single one of my one-on-one -on -one clients. They're like, my numbers, I'm like, that's about you. And the more you focus that. on that, that's about you. That's not about them. And it goes the same for critique. It's the same for appearing salesy. That's about you. That's not about them. They're going to go eat Oreos in five minutes and forget they even saw you. <laughs> You're worried about that. They're yeah. yeah. And so it's really, it's like this self-centered thing that we do like, oh, I feel so guilty. Oh, I feel so bad. Oh, you're not worried about that. You're worried about you. And so this is why I say business growth is personal growth and personal growth is business growth because you've got to confront these things and you can't bring in more money until you do. And that's really where a lot of the healing has to take place in order to bring in more money. <laughs> I know. We're, we're, I have so many questions. I, I could literally talk to you all day, but I do. I do. Um, I want to bring up one more thing. Yeah. If Trish is okay with it. And, and here's the thing. I know that we've been in like, I would, okay. I don't know how much of this is research-based, but I'm going to give you my predictions and opinions and whatever that's worth. I, I feel like there's women out there who could resonate with this, but I feel like up until this pandemic, we lived in a world that was male dominated in the sense that it was difficult for the general collective who weren't mothers to understand the difficulty, and I don't want to use the word sacrifice, but the challenge in running a business as a mom, because their variables only apply to mothers. Mm -hmm. And so I think that now that everybody's home with kids trying to do business and understanding the kind of... Um, levity that comes with the, the, the challenges of being the responsible parent for children while trying to make an impact. Um, now it's like a collective experience, men and women. So there's this hope, I guess, that on the other side of this, that looks different. Being a mom and balancing a badass business with being a mother is acceptable and a, it, we're able to do that. It doesn't feel like, well, I'm going to let my husband make the big bucks and have his empire because I've got to be a mom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think you're pointing to a conversation and a perspective that will shift in a lot of areas because of this. Um, I, I live by a principle. It's a philosophical principle. It's called the veil of ignorance. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this. Um, it's actually introduced to me by my husband who studied constitutional law. And they talk about this. Okay. And the idea is you really, you construct laws and you create your social contracts from the perspective of a veil of ignorance, meaning you write a law or choose to interact with others as if you were the least of these. So you have to do the work to understand what other people are going through so that you can write a law to protect them at the very bottom and you write it as if you were at the very bottom and it was actually protecting you. Now the veil of ignorance is very difficult to live through because you don't know, you're freaking ignorant. <laughs> like Saturday Night Live did a great skit about this on the night that Trump won the election when it was called the white person's living room where the white people were like, oh my gosh, you guys, what if we have guns in our neighborhoods? And their black friends are like, yeah, what if you have guns in your neighborhood? That must be awful. And they're like, what if our needs aren't met by the government? They're like, yeah, what if your needs aren't met? That must be awful. And it was this, I mean, it was a satire, but it was a conversation on a veil that had been lifted. And I think the veil between the sexes has been lifted, to your point, Linda. But I think there's another veil, and, and I do think, I, I'm in the midst of it at the moment, so it's really present for me, but is what happened with Alicia Keys and that song. And it's, you know, good job showing worker after work, after worker after worker, these people cleaning the subways, these people delivering food, the people picking our salads, the people out there all the days, every day is cleaning the bathrooms in the, ho in the hospitals, like con the veil of ignorance and that silent swath of humanity that has allowed all of us to live the way we live is now visible too. So Linda, I think women are part of it. I think minorities are part of it. I think migrant workers are part of it. I think this BS that if you're rich, nothing's gonna happen to you is part of it. I think this, this great leveler of this invisible force, which may very well be here to serve us at the highest level, it's gonna bring, it's gonna be lifting up a whole bunch of veils 
that we have all been ignorant of. And I think as much as we may have been on the receiving end of that as women, and I think we absolutely have, I think we've also got other people we need to look at where we have been the perpetrators of the ignorance. And I think this is an incredible opportunity as you're looking at who am I here to serve? What am I here to do? How can I make my bank account congruent with the amount of love I'm pouring out into the world? As you start to ask these questions, my advice you would be look at where you have been ignorant and allow the causes to pull to you. And you'll be just blown away at the ideas you'll have either for business or partnerships or affiliate relationships or brand new business ideas you never even thought of before that can come to mind. It'll end up being sponsored by huge corporations, which happened to three of my clients just this week. All of these things are available to us. And if you're feeling stuck and you're feeling scared, there's a fear that you need to heal. And you need to recognize that you are the block to the abundance. And if you're a mother, the very same abundance that allowed you to develop a spleen and a spinal cord and a liver and the kidneys for your child while you were worried about paying the light bill. That's the same abundance. And it didn't take anything for you to do that right? You just did it because that's what you're designed to do. So when you are not making money at the level that you could be or should be, or that doesn't match the service you're putting out there, you are blocking it because that's what you're designed to do. So okay, hold on. this good. comes from a book called The Illusion of Money by Kyle Cease. I love this book so much. I want to crawl inside it and live there. That's how much I love this book. <laughs> and I'm just going to read you one quote I read. Uh, at the beginning of March, I had the amazing opportunity to meet Oprah and hang out with her for a while. And she kicked my ass, which was awesome. But um, one of the things I loved is I was on the plane ride home when I wrote the, well, I didn't write this, when I wrote in the book. You know, I don't know if you can see, but I wrote all over the book. I was like, oh my God, and another thing, and another thing. And I was like, oh, that's why she kicked my butt. Um, and it was really bad because I was hiding at my level where I was and I knew there was more for me to do, but I was still holding back, which I'm no longer doing. But um, from this book, it's called The Truth. I, I highlighted it as The Truth of, About Abundance. Um, and it starts with the flow of abundance and flow of abundance is in quotes. But the flow of abundance is not just something that sounds nice. It's a real thing. It's beating your heart. It's growing your hair. It's shining the sun. It's growing the plants. It's a creative energy that wants to move into this world in a powerful way. If you are not stepping into who you are and letting this energy flow in, then you are blocking it. You are an obstacle to life. It wants to move through you. But if your stagnant mental beliefs are standing in the way, then you are at war with that flow. The world needs you so badly. The world needs you to free it from its lack of flow, from its blocks and limitations, and from its illusion. The world needs you to actually live and be an example of the abundant flow that brings forward moving ideas and new revelations into existence. And I'll just leave you with that. When you go and you get scared and you're worried about the next bill or you're worried about this economy, you're worried about this pandemic, the virus isn't worried about abundance. Trees aren't worried about abundance. This is a mental construct that we have created and decided to perpetuate. Now, that's not to say there aren't bills to pay. You still have to live profoundly related to reality and to have integrity with how you deal with this massive source of love that we call money. You have to take responsibility for that and live in integrity. But part of living in integrity and paying your bills on time is honoring the talents, the experience, and the expertise that you have been given and making sure that you are charging appropriately for the amount of love that you are putting out onto the planet and that you don't hide from that and you don't make it small and you don't fit all over it by pretending like, oh, I don't take money. That's the exchange we have for it right now. And you don't get to come in and act like you know better than everybody else and you don't have to play in this world. This is the world that we are all playing in right now. Once you're inside of it, you can reconstruct it from the inside out, but trying to pretend it isn't real or it doesn't exist isn't going to help. Anybody. Or it doesn't apply to us. Yeah, oh, I'm above all that money. Are you? Hmm. Yeah. How can mortgage company feel about that again? Like, it's, like it doesn't work yeah. that way. We still have to live here for now. And, and one of the things I say to the women I work with is, look, because money is the most powerful tool we have access to right now, I want you to have more of it. Because I'll tell you something, 
if we had more money in the hands of more women, the precision with which we drop bombs within inches of where we want them, women wouldn't do that. We don't drop bombs on other people's children. We might drop food, we might drop medical supplies, we might drop education, we might drop doctors. We're not gonna drop bombs. And it's time for us to start to own our part or silence in this global conversation. And we can't do that right now unless we have access to the world's most powerful tool. You're not supposed to make the host cry, Sarah. <laughs> Dude, I got like chills <laughs> on my whole body. My all te- I'm all tear. This was, yeah. th- this was exactly what I think both of us needed. And I know for sure everybody who's watching right now, um, needed this conversation and i really hope that a million people watch this um so or more let's not limit it uh, you know um because it is such an important conversation and and also i want to make sure that people know how to see you get more of you connect with you um because you are such a gift you are such a beautiful beautiful light in this world right now it takes one to know one just saying. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll receive it. I'll receive mm. it. Good. Good. Send me the money conversation too. We'll <laughs> yeah. all receive that part too, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you can find me at sarahwalton.com. I also go live, like I said, inside my Facebook group um, every single morning at 10 a.m. Eastern during the week, just to set people up with an intention for the day and a sort of a, a basis of a conversation to, to construct the day. But it's the Game on Girlfriend Insider. And the reason it's called Game on Girlfriend Insider is Game on Girlfriend is the name of my podcast um, because I believe the game is on and it is time for women to start playing. <laughs> so the game is on and I love Sherlock. So that's sort of where that came from too. Yeah. The game is afoot. Well, I think if there's ever a woman who can change the world, you, I, I feel like you, you are that woman and I, you embodied, you, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Um, you present information with your heart and, it's, and it resonates and it's deep and it's wise and it's gentle. And I, I, I could go on with adjectives, but... Um, <laughs> I think that anybody like me who has a heart and a soul, um, you've just spoken to them. So, so thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for creating this platform where more people can hear it. It matters. Mm-hmm.